Well, good morning, Chapel Hill. It's uh, good to be with you again. I wanted to go uh, to the early pages of Luke's Gospel this morning. Uh, this, uh, this is in Luke chapter 1, and it starts in verse 67. It's, uh, it's Zechariah's song, and I wanted to kind of pull a verse out of, his, uh, of this, these verses. It's his worship to God, and I wanted to highlight something for us this morning. But before we do that, um, let me pray for us. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your love for us. I pray for those, every one of us who are watching this video right now, I pray that your blessing would be upon us, that we would have a good day today, that we would have day, uh, moments in this day that have opportunities for us to share your word with other people. And Father, share our love for you with others who need to love you too. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so this is... Uh, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 67. This is a song of Zechariah. Zechariah uh, was the uh, uh, father of, um, of John the Baptist. And you remember his story. He's, he's the high priest, and he's doing this thing, and, and an angel appears to him and tells him he's going to have a baby. And, and he says, well, I'm not sure that's going to happen. And the angel gets mad at him and doesn't get mad at him, but he kind of makes him so he can't talk. And he... He can't talk for several uh, months, and finally they have the baby, and John the Baptist is born, and they ask him for his, what should we name the child? He says his name is John, and his, uh, he's able to speak, and so he sings this song uh, as he anticipates uh, John the Baptist. It really is a prophecy. This, this song of Zechariah is a prophecy. A song of praise and worship becomes a song of prophecy that Jesus is going to be the Savior of the world. And so um, you'll see the elements of prophecy in this song, but uh, it, bas it basically starts in uh, verse 68. He says, Zechariah says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. And then he says the thing that I, this, then he gives us this verse that I, I'm not going to go into all the song, but this verse I just wanted to kind of pluck out of his song and just kind of exegete a little bit for you because it's just kind of a fascinating reference. Um, verse 69 says, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about, this this horn of salvation. What in the world does Zechariah mean when he says he has raised for us a horn of salvation? Uh, well, I will say, that, uh, a kind of spoiler alert, uh, the, the horn of salvation is basically Jesus. It's, he's talking about, he's, he's the father of John the Baptist, but he's prophesying the coming of, of Jesus. And so this, this horn of salvation has an it has interesting roots in the Old Testament. It goes all the way back to the to the uh, book of Exodus where God tells uh, uh, the Israelites how to build uh, the temple or the uh, tabernacle and the altar of sacrifice. And uh, going back to um, Exodus chapter 27, verse 1, uh, God says, Build an altar of acacia wood three cubits high. It is to be square, five, five cubits long and five cubits wide. And then he says in verse 2, he says, Make a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns and the altar are one piece, are of one piece, and overlay the altar with bronze. So in the design of the altar, God tells Moses that he wants uh, these four corners of the altar to have these little horns on the altar. And so that's just kind of how we, you know, we see how it was designed. And, uh, and later on in the New Test or in the Old Testament, in the Book of Kings, um, we see two instances where people went to the tabernacle and went to, well, actually they went to the temple, and they went in and they uh, took hold of the horns of the altar. Uh, the two people were Adonijah and Joab. Adonijah and Joab were part of conspiracy. Joab was the commander of of the Israel's army. And uh, Adonijah, Adonijah wanted to be the king. So Joab and Adonijah conspired against King Solomon uh, to, to, over, to take the kingdom. And when they were caught, both of them, and first, and I'll read these passages to you. First Kings chapter 1, verse 50 is the first one. Uh, both of these men go to take hold of the horns of the altar. And uh, says, First Kings 1, 50 says, But Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, went and took hold of the horns of the altar. And then the, the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 28, uh, says when the news had reached Joab, who had conspired with Adonijah, uh, though not with Absalom, 
he fled to the tent of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. So you get a, a fast from, from these two people. You get a fascinating uh, understanding of the horns of the altar. And when you, whenever you see the, the phrase, horn, you know, the horns of the altar or the horn of my salvation, you, you, this is a reference to this 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 kind of concept. And so Adonijah and uh, Joab uh, are afraid for their lives, and they run into the tent of the Lord, and they take hold of the horns of the altar. And in so doing, uh, they they want it, they're fleeing to a place of safety so that Solomon can't come and, and kill them, because the thought is that this is the altar, and no one's gonna if you're gonna if you're hanging onto the altar, no one's gonna kill you in a place. Uh, where the animal sacrifices are made in this holy holy place, and so I, I, it, it, it's assumed that this became a, a practice of uh, of last hope, uh, where you're in trouble, someone's chasing you, and you go and you take hold of the horns of the altar. Um, then later on, even later in the in the Old Testament, um, in the Book of Amos, the prophets uh, were. By the time Amos came around, the prophets were prophesying against the Israelites because they were they were so they had so often kind of abandoned God and they just went their own way. They had other gods and all those kind of things. And so Amos, in his prophesying the passion passionate anger of God, uh, Amos chapter three verse fourteen refers to the altar horns of the altar, and he says this. The prophet speaking for God says, "On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel." And then he says this uh, interesting way of wording this. God says, "The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground." Well, what's he saying? Why are why are you focusing on these horns of the altar? Why would they be cut off? God is basically saying he's fed up with Israel. How many times? They have abandoned uh, God, and they and he basically said there will be no horns for you to go and hold on to anymore. This is it. There's no hope for you. This judgment is coming. Punishment is coming. There's no there's gonna, there will be no place for you to go for safety. And so that's what he's saying about these horns of, of the altar. And then all the way back to the New Testament where we're studying now. This is where I, where I wanted us to come to um, this phrase of, of Zechariah, where he says. Once again, in his song, uh, prophesying the coming of Jesus, even to this uh, nation of Israel that had been a, that abandoned God so much that God said there is no hope of salvation, he says in Luke one sixty nine, he says God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, and that is a glorious truth that even though the people of God turned away from him time and time again to the point where he said there is no hope, there is no horn of salvation, Jesus came into that darkness and he became for us the horn of salvation. He became for us that thing that we hold on to when we're in trouble. And I guess I say that to you now, today, to use in your heart to know and remember this, that when you are in trouble, Jesus is the one to hold on to. So flee to him, run to him, and take hold of Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. Thank you, Father, for this promise to us that Jesus has become a horn of salvation to us who will flee to him in our trouble, who will run to him in our danger, who will escape to him when we are in peril. I pray, God, that this day would mark a day when we would uh, remember for always and forever that we have a horn of salvation in Jesus and he is the one we always can hope in for our safety and for our salvation. I pray these blessings on us in Jesus name. Amen. Once again, God bless uh, Chapel Hill and we will talk to you soon.